few uh, slides to finish on lecture five. And I wanted to kind of go through lab four and the structures of the liver and the pancreas. And we could go back to lecture three for a little bit of that. And we'll be set. So I think last time I recall from yesterday then we had just talked about transamination and deamination, right? Yeah. That's what I thought. All right. So the other thing that the liver does is it helps uh, manage lipids in a way in which we can transfer lipids throughout our body without creating a bunch of plaque in all of our arteries and veins. So what the liver does as the dietary fats are coming uh, to the liver from the digestive system is to attach proteins to them. And then because the proteins have charges, then that makes the, mo the molecules more water soluble so that they can actually be carried in the water. So essentially what the liver does is make these lipoproteins that are, are better for transport. And then the way we have classified them is we look at how much protein is actually been combined with the liver. And so we use high density, low density, and very low density to, to look at that relationship. So high density lipoproteins, which would be HDLs, are, are fats that are, uh, have quite a bit of protein to them, so they're the most water soluble. So in a clinical aspect, when you look at total cholesterol, uh, we kind of think of HDLs as good cholesterol. Uh, and we look at a ratio between uh, high-density lipoproteins and low-density lipoproteins within, within the total cholesterol number uh, because they're the most soluble. And then low-density lipoproteins, LDLs, are ones that are less soluble because they don't have as much load uh, protein. And so we look at those very closely when we look at, at lipids in a clinical environment as well. So, so basically, you want these uh, low-density lipoproteins to be 120 or less in your total cholesterol uh, count, and you want the high-density lipoproteins to be 45 or greater. So that you have a ratio of the two uh, that we think are beneficial. So in a clinical environment, it hasn't been until the last probably uh, 10 years that we've actually looked at very low-density lipoproteins as a way to categorize somebody's risk of plaque that would lead to stroke or heart attacks. And it's now becoming more and more common to actually test for those uh, when you do blood screens for cholesterol. But very low density lipoproteins are the least soluble. So they have they create the greatest problem with with creating plaques. So that's why uh, that's why they're being explored and actually being looked at in a clinical environment more. And then uh, so there's a stepwise process that we talked about the other day uh, with, fruit, with lipids. So since lipids exist in our blood largely as triglycerides, then again we have that three carbon glycerol molecule, and to that we have fatty acids attached to it. So if we, if we start cleaving the bond between the fatty acids, so we have these free fatty acids, then that's lipolysis. So that's the first step. And what we want to do in lipolysis is to free up the three carbon compound and then to have these fatty acids that are free as well. And so because we have a three carbon compound, then we can use this three carbon compound through gluconeogenesis to derive energy out of it. And so then the second step is to, to manage these long chain fatty acids so that they are these long chain carbon carbon molecules that on one end have that carboxylic acid <coughs> molecule, which is why they're called fatty acids. And then on the other parts of the molecule, we just have hydrogen ions. And then what we do is we categorize them based upon the presence of double bonds. So if we had a double bond here, then we would say it's an unsaturated fat. If there is no double bond in the molecule, we'd say it is a saturated fat. And then if we only have a single double bond, then it's a monounsaturated fat. 
if there are two or more double bonds and it's a poly that's saturated fat. So when you actually look at the labels on oil, for example, it gives you that characteristic. Double bonds can get a little more unstable, so we can fragment it into and it's hard. <laughs> the, the next step is actually beta oxidation. So in beta oxidation, what we're going to do is we're going to cleave the bond between every two carbon molecules. So we end up with these two carbon fragments. So remember, acetyl-CoA is a two carbon molecule. So that allows us to actually take the fat and, and start at the point of acetyl-CoA and then run it through uh, the Krebs cycle to make some more ATP and some more NADH, okay? So if you think about it, then what we did yesterday is we kind of looked at the math of that. So what we, what we said was from the process of glycolysis, we actually got two ATP directly, <coughs> and then we made two NADHs that we could make <coughs> ATP from an electron transfer system. And then in the conversion of fruit acid to, to acetyl-CoA, we didn't make any ATP directly, but we made two NADHs that accounted for 6 ATP. So since we're actually starting with these carbon molecules after these two steps, then we can actually generate the two ATP directly from uh, from the Krebs cycle, and then we can create the six NADHs that will account for 18 ATP, and the two FADHs that account for four. For every two carbon molecule that you can generate from a, a, a fatty acid, so that's why we actually do lipogenesis to store energy long term, is we can store so much energy in the molecule that we can recover. So it makes sense. Okay. So, so to make fats, that is lipogenesis, and that's the formation of fats from non-fats. So our classic example was would be if we have abundant carbohydrates, then we're going to do lipogenesis with the carbohydrates to make fats. And then that's our long-term storage, uh, and we do it because we can recover so much energy out of it by doing beta oxidation uh, of the fat molecules in the cells. So this is just kind of a, a flow chart of what we were just talking about. So, so in essence, <coughs> what the dietary fats do that are coming from uh, our intestine is our liver begins to process them. And so the liver makes cholesterol, and we, we absorb cholesterol from particular animal material that we ingest. So one of the things the liver has to do is kind of manage cholesterol. So it can, it can take cholesterol and convert it to lipoproteins and then transport those to cells, or it can get rid of ex, excess cholesterol. So remember, one of, the, one of the products in bile is cholesterol. So the liver uses bile to get rid of extra cholesterol. And then what we talked about with bile salts, remember, is that if you have excessive cholesterol in bile, it will begin to crystallize out with the salts, and that's what, that's what falls into gallstones. So then what you're going to do then is to convert part of it to these high-density lipoproteins, uh, and then we can circulate those in our blood. All right. And then we could also convert it to uh, low-density lipoproteins, and then that's the product that cells use to make membranes and stuff. So that's why you don't want zero uh, cholesterol in your blood because what we want to do is make membranes, and then all the lipid-based hormones uh, require a cholesterol molecule to make those. So endocrine organs that produce lipid-based hormones like testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, uh, all need cholesterol to make those. And then uh, the other one we talked about were these very low-density lipoproteins, uh, which we use to, to kind of create uh, energy and to do uh, by doing this process of uh, lipolysis first followed by beta oxidation second. So that's kind of the role of all those uh, lipoproteins in our metabolic processes. So 
what I want to do is I want to use this chart kind of to review a bunch of stuff we talked about yesterday. So remember last time, the chart that was similar to this, the digestive <coughs> system was at the center, and the large and small intestines were at the center of the, the blood vessel circle. And what we said was that was the absorptive phase. So that was the phase after we had been doing digestion. We were bringing products into our blood, and then we were going to manage those nutrients and energy sources. So because the liver is at the center of this one, what we're now looking at is a fasting stage, or what we would call a post-absorptive stage, where you've actually absorbed all the nutrients and it's been a period of time since you acquired new nutrients, so blood levels are dropping in the blood. So what we're gonna do is look at the processes by which we can return blood levels in our, in our blood to, to the levels we need to, to maintain. So the liver is critically important to, the, to that. Uh, and so if we, if we start the brain and it has starvation here, so we kind of know that. Then the brain is a key player in using ATP. It, it is probably the organ that uses the most ET, ATP in your body, it is your brain. So it's, it's great at taking glucose and making ATP out of it. So what would this process be? Glycolysis and cellular respiration. Okay. But what the brain is not very good at is only doing glycolysis and only generating the two ATP glucose molecule. Uh, so it's a high user of O2 as well. So it's one of the, it with skeletal muscle are probably the two organs that are the biggest consumers of, of O2 because it specializes in making ATP through the Krebs cycle and, and electron transport through mitochondria. So it can generate 38 ATP per glucose molecule. Okay. So, if we look at skeletal muscle, then if we're in a fasting or starving state and blood sugar levels have dropped significantly, then one of the things that we can use to generate ATP is protein. So that's what we see in, in populations of people that are actually malnourished and starving or people that have an eating disorder like anorexia. So what they'll eventually do is take their their muscle protein. So we're talking about the actin and myosin that we create to make uh, to make pr pr the muscles contract. So if you think back about what we talked about when we did muscles, when you increase muscle mass, you don't increase the number of muscle cells, but you increase the diameter of existing cells. So the way you increase muscle mass once you've reached your adult stature is to actually add more actin and myosin and add more myofibrils to the inside of a muscle cell. And that increases the diameter of the cell and increases the force at which a muscle can contract. So the inverse is true in, in fast, in starting. Uh, so if you aren't taking in enough nutrients so you're malnourished, whether it's because of a lack of supply, like in a good part of the world, or whether it's because you have an eating disorder, then what you're going to do is do the opposite. You're actually going to start taking the actinomyosin apart and taking myofibrils apart and begin to get the muscle cells smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So that's why when people are starving, the muscle mass of the arms and legs looks dinky compared to the average person. And so what you're actually doing is you're taking apart those, those muscle proteins, acting the myosin, and generating amino acids. Will it eventually destroy the cell itself? Uh, eventually, yeah. Okay. So, but usually you die, uh, usually anorexics die from, uh, uh, what you also do is start taking other, uh, you make other organs smaller. So usually what happens is, once you've taken most of your skeletal muscle mass, you have to retain some so you can still move around. So then you'll start doing the same thing to myocardial. So you'll start uh, taking myofibrils out of uh, skeletal cardiac muscle. And so one of the common reasons why uh, anorexic uh, dies from cardiac dysfunction over time. So 
So then what we're going to do is we're going to put the amino acids in the blood. And then what we're going to then do is depend upon organs that have the capacity then to take amino acids and utilize them to make ATP. And so this would be a two-step process. So what, what this first step would be, would be to get rid of nitrogen, which is the nitrogen toxin. So remember, amino acid construction is, is this molecule, and what makes it different are the functional groups. So the first step is to leave this bond and to, and to remove the, the amine group. So what, what was that reaction called? Deamination, right. So once we've deaminated, now we have a two carbon compound, which we can run through the Krebs cycle. At the same starting point, we could run these two carbon compounds. So if we're taking a non-sugar and we're making ATP out of it uh, in, our, in our sugar metabolism, then that, that is called gluconeogenesis. So when we're looking at seven, you just have to realize that there's actually two components to this process. One is you have to deaminate first, because nitrogen is toxic. And then you do gluconeogenesis so you can generate ATP out of it. And then <clears throat> notice that other tissues, uh, there's a couple other tissues that can do that as well. So well, that would be something we would do after we've done quite a bit of, after we've used up most of our other ready resources. So the starting point would actually be with glycogen, which is our short-term storage for sugar. Okay? So our liver and our skeletal muscle is where we store, store the most glycogen. So if we take the glycogen and we convert back to glucose, what's this reaction called? So is it going to be a lyse or a genesis? So remember, genesis is to form, lyse is to break. So if we're taking a large molecule and converting it back to small molecules, then it's a lysis. And in water, we lysing glycogen, so glycogeno, lysis. So the naming system isn't something you necessarily have to memorize. There are two endings, lyse or genesis. And the prefix is always the molecule that you're dealing with, right? So when we made the glycogen, it was glyco glycogenesis. And if we're going to break the glycogen down, then it's glycogenolysis. And that gives us the sugar that we can put in our blood so that our brain can use the sugar, our heart can use the sugar, and other things can use the sugar. So that would be the first step. And so we would deplete these glycogen stores first before we do anything else. I mean, that's one of the key things to exercise and weight loss is through exercise you force your skeletal muscles to use up glycogen. And then if you ingest new food, instead of doing lipogenesis with the, with the sugar, you do the glycogen. Then you have to exercise again to deplete the, deplete the glycogen. So as long as you're exercising and deplete, depleting glycogen in muscle mass, then any, any uh, calories you take in that you don't use, you don't make fat out of, but you actually make more glycogen out of it as a store. Right? And then controlling the amount of calories so that you never make an abundance of glycogen so that you turn convert to glycogenesis. And so once you've used your glycogen stores, then the next step is actually going to be is to use our fat stores. Okay? So then the, the the reaction to going from a triglyceride to glycerol fatty acid would be what reaction? Lipolysis, right? Because we're going for a large molecule to four small molecules, three fatty acids and one glycerol. What are we breaking down? Fat, so lipolysis. And then once we have freed up our free fatty acids, then we can send those fatty acids in our blood to places where they can be used. So notice our heart could use fatty acids to make ATP. 
Other tissues can use fatty acids to make ATP. Our liver can use fatty acids to make ATP. So if we're using fatty acids to make ATP, what was that reaction? So it's the same reaction we did right here, which was beta oxidation of fats, right? So anytime we see fatty acids to ATP, we're going to take the fatty acid molecule, <coughs> cleave it, cover two bonds, so that we get a, a acetyl compound that we can run through the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. So one of the dilemmas with with doing excessive amounts of, of beta oxidation of fats is that we don't use all of those two carbon compounds to make ATP, but some of the two carbon compounds get converted to uh, compounds we call ketones. And then ketones have really a unique uh, smell to them. So if you have if you had a patient who's a diabetic, and they're an insulin-dependent diabetic, so a type 1 diabetic, and they are not managing their insulin at all so that they are managing their blood sugar and insulin, then what will happen over time is they'll be forced into beta oxidation of fats. And as they do a lot of beta oxidation of fats, then they'll create ketone bodies. And as they create ketone bodies, their breath becomes sweet-smelling, kind of like uh, juicy fruit gum and their urine will become a little sweet smell, uh, like juicy fruit gum. And that just tells you, and it, so it would occur in starvation, and it would occur in, in like diabetes where they're not controlled at all. And then that tells you they're doing a trillion of beta oxidation of fats uh, because they have these ketones. Now fortunately, uh, the brain can actually use those ketones to make ATP. Cardiac muscle can use the ketones to make ATP, as well as some other tissues. That process is called ketogenesis, so where we form ketones. So ketones, we're going to form them, so ketogenesis. And it's a classic for knowing that somebody's shifted from carbohydrate, normal carbohydrate metabolism and uh, to fat, fat metabolism to try to retrieve energy out of it. Okay. So then over here, where we're going from uh, glucose to glucose 6-phosphate to prudic acid. So what's this first part of this reaction called? Glycolysis, right? And we can make prudic acid in the absence of oxygen. And if we are in the absence of oxygen, then we cannot do the Krebs cycle of electron transport So we end up doing anaerobic respiration. The end product of anaerobic respiration is lactic acid. So that occurs in extreme exercise events where muscle mass becomes uh, in low oxygen. Then to continue to try to make ATP so you can do power strokes, then muscles enter anaerobic respiration where they make lactic acid. For years we thought that the lactic acid built up in muscle mass, which explained the soreness, that, that exists within muscles when they've been overworked. But recent evidence suggests that there is absolutely no buildup of lactic acid in muscles, that it's transferred to the blood really quickly. Then what's actually amazing is your heart can actually use the lactic acid to make ATP. So it's another example of gluconeogenesis, where you're taking this lactic acid and you generate ATP out of it. Or our normal pathway would be to have enough oxygen on board so we can do aerobic respiration, which would be the Krebs cycle and the electron transport system. So the net gain in this pathway is 2 ATP. The net gain in this pathway is 36 to 38 ATP. So a very large difference in the amount of ATP that we could actually produce. Cool. All right, so this is kind of the, the next two are just kind of review uh, of things we've talked about. So this is the absorptive stage. So when you're looking at this one, then uh, what it matches, if you want to go back and match it to uh, the other summary, would be this one where the gastrointestinal tract is at the center. So in this instance, because we have a wealth of resources on board because we're absorbing, then the most common reaction we're going to do is going to end in genesis 
if we're if we're going to store molecules, uh, but the other way is we would use the excess sugar for whatever energy needs we need right away. Okay. So when you're comparing those two, then what you're going to see is that is that we have nutrients being absorbed into the blood in forms of glucose, amino acids, and lipids. And then what we're going to do is we're going to try to, to take the glucose. So the, the standard thing we would do is use it to make ATP. So whatever ATP you need at that point in time, when you have excess glucose on board, you're going to, you're going to use it to make ATP. And the hormone that drives that is insulin. And insulin is produced where? In the pancreas. What's the specific area of the pancreas? Uh, that's the background. And what specific cell? Theta cells, right? And then in liver and skeletal muscle, if we have, if we've got all our ATP we need, then what we're going to do is take glucose and convert it to glycogen for storage. So what's that reaction called? So we're going to end in lice or genesis? And in genesis. As we're going from glucose to glycogen. And so genesis, and what are we making? Glycogen, so glycogenesis. So just add S I S to the end of the word. Alright. So what are we gonna do with amino acids? Well, if we have if we have all of the amino if we have all the energy we need then we're not going to use amino acids for uh, energy, but we're actually going to use them to do protein synthesis. So to make new proteins, structural proteins for our cells. Uh, so if we have these abundant amino acids from our diet, and we're making our muscle mass work really hard, then what we would do is take the amino acids and convert it to actinomyosin, incorporate that into myofibrils and make our muscle cells bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So during periods of time when bodybuilders are really trying to build muscle mass, they, they, make, they eat these incredible high protein diets. So years ago I used to work out a lot, there was a lot of bodybuilders and there was a woman who I would always spot and when she was building mass like several months before, before an event, I would ask her, what are you eating? And she'd say, oh, I eat six to seven chicken breasts a day. Just amazing muscle mass, yeah. And then right before, right before, a, uh, right before a meat, she would just eat uh, vegetables and broccoli or something for several weeks. And then that's what would make her look really cut for the meat. And then after she was done with the meat, she'd go back to eating all this protein to maintain muscle mass pretty amazing. So anyway, and then the construction of proteins is driven by androgens and estrogens so as, as well as insulin and then uh, human growth hormone GH, which we'll talk about later. Then what are we going to do with lipids? So if so, we can store lipids in adipose tissue. Uh, so if we have abundant sugar and we're going to convert the sugar to lipids, what's that process for? Lipogenesis, right? So we could also we could do lipogenesis if we have abundant sugars, or we can just take the lipids out of our out of our uh, meal and store it as adipose tissue. But skeletal muscle can take lipids and use it for energy. So the first step in this process of ATP production would be lipolysis, followed by main oxidation of fat for our fatty acids and the gluconeogenesis from the glycerol. Okay. So notice that insulin is the most common hormone. So the take home message is insulin is our hormone uh, the absorption stage. Which is why it's critical to diabetics. So that they when they when they eat they inject insulin. And the injection of insulin is based on when they eat plus a long-acting insulin that they use at night right before they go to bed. 
So they, they're typically giving themselves at least four injections a day, uh, trying to manage the insulin in their blood. So this is the post-absorptive stage, or the way we can think about it is fasting uh, stage. So now we're going to go from having abundant resources in our blood to having low levels of resources in our blood. So what we want to do is pull the resources out of storage to return them back to our blood so we can continue to do the process of making the energy to, to run our body's uh, equipment. So, so notice that glucagon, glucagon are the hormones that we have talked about, glucagon and glucagon are the hormones that we're seeing over here. Uh, and then glucocorticoids are, are compounds released by the adrenal gland that sits on top of the kidney. And they're very important to carbohydrate metabolism as well. But we're going to talk about those when we get to the endocrine system. So the one we've talked about is glucagon, which is produced by what cells? Alpha cells. Alpha cells. And where are those alpha cells from? Pancreas, and where specifically in the pancreas? Lilo is the lagger. Right. So, if you're in a post absorptive stage, then what you're going to do is begin to break down the storage molecules and convert them back to our small molecules so that we can actually begin to uh, provide resources for ourselves. So, if we're talking about glucose, then we're, we would be in a we would start this process in the state of hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia. If we're in a post absorptive stage. Would we initially be in a hyperglycemic state or hypoglycemic state? We'd be in a hypoglycemic state. Because we've been we've been fasting and we've used up all the blood sugar. So now what we have to do is try to recover our blood sugar. So that's when kids get really cranky. Babies start crying because they want to feed because they're in a hypoglycemic state. Some adults get really cranky when they're in a state of hypoglycemia. When I exercise with my wife, I, I move away from her when she gets into that state. She gets really cranky. So what we would want to do is break down our glycogen stores first. So that would be glycogenolysis. That would recover glucose. So once we've broken down our glycogen stores, then we can begin to make new sugars from other sources, which would be gluconeogenesis. <coughs> and the end product is glucose, which is our favorite way to make ATP. All right. So remember, if we've used up all of these sugars and they're gone, then we're going to begin to break down fats. Uh, and so what do we call the breakdown of fats over here to make ATP? So the first step, I realize the second step, plus the proteogenesis. And then that allows us to make more ATP from our fat molecules. But as we shift from this passive, passive carbohydrate metabolism to our fat metabolism, then we're going to end up also forming ketones. That was called ketogenesis. And then some tissues like the brain and the heart can actually use ketones as an energy source at all, as well to make uh, ATP out of it. And so the pattern we've used is, is our, our quick energy stores are sugar. Our secondary energy stores are fat. If we used up a lot of our fat, we've used up our quick energy stores, then we'll convert to breaking down the muscle and retrieving amino acids. Uh, and so if we break down muscle, then what's that process called? So protein synthesis is formation of muscles. So what's the generic name for a biochemical uh, reaction that takes large molecules and creates small molecules. Catabolism. catabolism. So then if we break down proteins, it's protein catabolism. Right. So then we get three amino acids. Then what do we have what do we call removing the amine group? Deamination. And then we have a two carbon compound and we can do undergo 
gluconeogenesis may or ATP. Yeah. So what we want to do in lab today is we want to, we want to look at uh, the structure of the liver and pancreas. Right? And in uh, the lecture that we have done related to that was uh, actually looking at uh, the liver itself. And we've actually talked about some of this mechanism. So I just want to kind of review some anatomy with you. Uh, Use this plus models and then talk about, and then review some things we were just talking about. The liver does in terms of reactions. So when we look at the liver, then the liver itself is divisible into sorry, I spoke the liver. 